Assalamu alaikum brothers and sisters wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, we've reached ayah number 55 of Surah at tawbah And as we've been discussing, the verses revolve around the reaction of the Sahaba to the Prophet's call for them to participate in the Battle of Tabuk. We've mentioned that the Battle of Tabuk was a battle in which the Holy Prophet was summoning his companions to travel a long distance to the, the border of the Roman Empire and face off against the formidable Roman army. And as we're reading in the, uh, in the ayat, many of the companions refused to join. Some of them were reluctant. Many of them came to the Holy Prophet and put forward excuses as to why they were not able to participate. Some of those excuses were logistical excuses. Some of the companions would say that, you know, I don't have a horse. I don't have a weapon, so I can join. Others put forward ethical excuses. And there were a group of them, there were a group of the munafiqeen among the companions who wanted to sit on the fence. They were not willing to fully commit to supporting the Prophet, and nor did they want to sit back and do nothing. They offered monetary support. They offered the Prophet financial support. So if the Prophet is victorious, they'll claim to have aligned themselves with the Prophet. They would claim that we supported you. And if the Prophet was defeated because they stayed back, they can say that we were never with him. We never joined him on this military expedition. Now in ayah number 55, it seems that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is answering a question that may be lingering in the minds of the believers. You see, brothers and sisters, some of the most devout companions and supporters of the Holy Prophet were the fuqara, were poor, they were destitute. And you find that many of the munafiqeen, many of the Prophet's opponents, whether they are kuffar or they are munafiqeen, many of them were wealthy. They had very stable lives. They had great wealth. They came from big families. So some of the mu'mineen may have been plagued with the following question in their minds. It's a question that may have crossed their minds. And that is that if these people have no faith, why has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed them with wealth and children? If they are hypocrites, if they are enemies of God, why is it that they have so much security and stability in their lives? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, here he responds. And this goes to show you, brothers and sisters, that even some of the sincere companions of the Prophet, some of those who supported the Prophet, the believers, many of them had a very simplistic outlook on what constitutes nearness to God. They have this impression that if, if you're living, if Allah has given you wealth and children and you're living in a state of prosperity, this is a sign that Allah is pleased with you. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here in ayah number 55, he says, فَلَا تُعْجِبْكَ أَمْوَالُهُمْ وَلَا أَوْلَادُهُمْ These munafiqeen, they have so much wealth that they say, Ya Rasulullah, accept financial support as an alternative to our physical presence in the battlefield. So accept this financial support. They had a lot of money. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, do not be impressed and do not let their wealth and their children impress you. Because many of the munafiqeen were affluent. They had an incredible amount of wealth. They had extraordinary wealth. They had children. They had family. God desires to punish them through it in the life of this world and that their souls should depart while they are disbelievers. Now it's interesting 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds to this question that's lingering in the minds of the believers. And that is that if these people have no faith, why has Allah given them so much? So some of the mu'mineen were very simplistic in their outlook. They believed that wealth and children were indicators of nearness to God. But here, interestingly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us two things. Number one, he tells the Prophet and he tells the believers, do not let their wealth and their children impress you. That's number one. Number two, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Innama yuridu Allahu li yu'adhibahum biha fil hayat dunya Now we know that Allah will punish the munafiqeen, the hypocrites in the hereafter. But Allah here, what does he say? He says, and God desires to punish them with it. He wishes to punish them in this life through their wealth and through their children. So not only is Allah telling us not to be impressed with their wealth and their children, Allah is saying that I will make their wealth and their children a source of misery for them in this life. Now, why is how does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make someone's wealth and someone's children, their family, a source of punishment for them? Now, brothers and sisters, there is nothing inherently wrong with wealth and children. There's nothing inherently, they're considered blessings of Allah. But how you deal with these blessings can determine whether these become a source of happiness or a source of grief in your life. Now, if you see, if you perceive wealth and children as being your sources of security independent of God, then they will become the source of your misery and grief. If you become overly attached to your wealth and your children and you start to feel that they belong to you, when you say that this is my wealth, you actually believe that it belongs to you. When you look at your children and your family members, you believe that they are yours. They're your property. They belong to you. The moment you forget that these two blessings have been placed at your disposal as an amana, they will become the source of your misery. And the moment you feel that wealth and children, because human beings consider wealth and children as the two main sources of support and stability and security in this life. You know, people who have money feel secure. And people who don't have money and they have extended family, they feel a sense of strength and security. So the moment you become overly attached to these two things and you perceive them as your source of security and strength and prosperity, Allah will make these two things the source of your misery. There's a hadith from the Holy Prophet that sheds light on this idea. The Prophet says, Man asbaha wa amsa wal akhiratu akbar the Holy Prophet says there are two types of people in this world. There are those who when they get up in the morning and when they go to bed at night, their primary concern is the hereafter, meaning they direct all of their efforts, everything that they do, is ultimately for a higher purpose. All of their actions and their endeavors are directed towards the hereafter. Someone who rises in the morning and wakes up at night and goes to sleep at night, and the akhirah is your main concern, the hereafter is your primary concern in your life, Allah will place contentment in your heart. You will feel this sense of richness in your heart. Ghina, the self-sufficiency. 
amra, and Allah will take care of your affairs by making the hereafter your primary goal in life by directing all of your efforts to ensure that your hereafter is prosperous, Allah will take care of your dunya for you. And you will not depart this life until you acquire everything that has been decreed for you, meaning you're not going to miss anything out. So here we're talking about the heart. The limbs should struggle and strive, but a heart that is always preoccupied with the akhirah is always at rest. So this is one type of person. And then you have the majority of people, unfortunately. Women asbaha wa amsa. The Prophet says, as for the one who rises up in the morning and goes to sleep at night, dunya akbar while this worldly life, this material life, is his greatest concern, Ja'alallahu al faqra bayna aynay. Allah will place poverty in front of your two eyes, meaning you will always be in a state of anxiety. You're always afraid of your financial situation. And your affairs will feel like they're in chaos. And you will not attain from this life except what that which has been decreed for you. So someone who's concerned and immersed in this dunya, your heart is just so attached and obsessed, you will always feel this state of agitation. You'll always feel like you're running away from poverty. You'll feel like poverty is like this entity, this shadow that's always looming over you. And this is the reality, brothers and sisters. You know, even people who are wealthy, they undergo a great amount of stress to acquire their wealth. So step one is to amass great wealth. And you may think that all of their troubles are gone once they acquire great wealth. But if you speak to any billionaire or millionaire, believe me, your problems only begin once you amass wealth. So once you endure the stress of gathering wealth, you have to deal with the anxiety and the stress of safeguarding your wealth. You know, you, you have to protect your wealth. You're worried about people cheating you, people who are out to rob you. You're always checking your balances. You're always checking the stock market. So even, even people who are wealthy, Allah says, because their hearts are so attached to the dunya, I always put poverty in front of their eyes. They never feel like they have enough. You know, even someone like Warren Buffett, a multi-billionaire, do you think that he doesn't have any stress? The moment the stock market dips a little bit, he might have a heart attack because his heart is completely preoccupied. Not his, just in general. His, a person's heart is preoccupied with this life. So the things that people pursue because they believe that it will bring them comfort, ironically, Allah makes it the source of their misery. And the same thing applies to children, brothers and sisters. You know, I meet many parents who do their best to raise their children properly. And when their children, you know, become misguided, it becomes a source of misery for them. Our responsibility, brothers and sisters, is that as parents, we have to advise. We guide them. We nurture them. But in the end, they belong to Allah. They don't belong to you. Yes, you are the biological father, the biological mother. Allah has given you certain responsibilities, but in the end, your children are a trust. If you put in all of your effort to raise them properly, you shouldn't grieve too much about the end result. It's in the hands of Allah. You fulfilled your duty. And you should never allow your emotional attachment to your children to make you compromise your Islamic values. You know, sometimes, you know, especially in this day and age, we have parents who are more concerned about waking their children up for school at six o'clock in the morning than waking their children up for Salat al-Fajr. 
during the week, the parents, they don't take no for an answer, even if you're not feeling well. They tell you, get up, you know, drink some orange juice, take an Advil, and go to school. Six o'clock in the morning, rain or shine. But on Saturday and Sunday, what happens? They let their children sleep in. Oh, because I feel bad for him. He has to wake up every day during the week. Let them rest. See, this is an example of how you allow your emotional attachment to your children to make you fail in your religious responsibility. There's a hadith from Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib, alayhi salam, where he says, he speaks about this attachment, this unhealthy attachment to our wealth and our children. And it's an attachment that people are not able to break away from even when they're on their deathbeds. Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, he says, in Nabna Adam, the human being, إِذَا كَانَ فِي آخِرِ يَوْمٍ مِنْ أَيَامِ الدُّنْيَا وَأَوَّلِ يَوْمٍ مِنْ أَيَامِ الْآخِرَ When the human being is on his deathbed, and, you're, and this is the last day of your dunya, and it's the first day of your akhirah, so you're in that, you know, the last day of your life is an interesting day, because it's the last day of your dunya, but it's the first day of your akhirah. On that day, when your soul is departing your body, the Imam says, that the human being sees his wealth, he will see his wealth, his children, and his actions. Now, this could either be metaphorical or literally in that spiritual realm, these three things will emerge as visible entities. So the Imam السلام, says when a person is dying, the human being will turn to his wealth. Now this turning to the wealth could be with your heart. You're on your deathbed, you feel helpless. Your heart naturally will gravitate towards what you perceive as a source of strength, a source of security. The human being will turn to his wealth. You will address your wealth, the wealth that you spent 30, 40, 50 years accumulating and acquiring, you will say to your mal, to your wealth, Wallahi inni kuntu alayka harisan shahiha. I swear by God that I was so protective of you. And indeed, brothers and sisters, we are very protective of our wealth. We put it in the best banks. We ensure that our money are in the best stocks. We, we protect our wealth. We safeguard it. So the human being is asking his wealth that I protected you. I expended so much effort to preserve you. What do you have for me today? How are you going to repay me on a day like this? So the wealth of the human being will say, I'll cover your shroud. Subhanallah. After all of this, you, you put in so much effort to protect your wealth, to preserve it, and now your wealth is saying, all that I can do for you is that I can give you a kefen, and that's it. That's all that I can provide for you. That's all of the help that I can give you. Then the human being turns to his children, to his family, and he will say, and this doesn't necessarily have to be on the tongue. The heart, the soul will say to the family, Wallahi inni kuntu lakum muhibban wa inni kuntum alaykum muhamiyan famada andakum. That I, I swear by God that I showed you so much love, that I protected you, I nurtured you. What do you have for me today? How, how are you able to help me? So the family will say, and again, this does not have to be verbal. Their state, you know, essentially uh, dictates this. What your family will be able to do for you is what? You know, when you die, they're not going to just let you rot on the face of the earth. They're going to carry you 
and they'll take you to the cemetery and they'll they'll bury you in the earth. They'll give you a proper burial. That's what your family can offer you. And believe me, in many cases, that's all they're going to offer for you. You'll be lucky if some family members even recite Surah Al-Fatiha for you or even remember to pay sadaqah on your behalf. That's what they're going to do for you. And then the human being. So these two things, wealth and children, even up until the last moment of your life, in many cases, they will become what? A source of disappointment. They'll disappoint you. And then the human being will turn to his a'mal, his actions, and he will say that I was not, I was very frugal when it came to you. I didn't, I was zahid when it came to performing good. But what do you offer me? The little good that I've done in my life, what do you offer me? My a'mal. Your good deeds, your a'mal will say to you, Ana qarinu fi qabrik. I will be your companion in your grave. Your wealth is gone. Your family will bury you and go back home. But I'll stick around. I'll be there with you in the grave. And I will be with you when you come out of your grave and stand before Allah on the Day of Judgment. So Allah is telling the believers, do not be impressed by the wealth and the children of these people. Allah, and if you look at the ayah, Allah says, Inna yuridu Allah desires, Allah wishes to punish them through, through it, through wealth and through children. Now this irada, what does the word yuridu Allah mean? In Islamic theology, Irada, divine, when Allah says he desires something, either it is irada tashri'iya, it is legislative desiring. You know, Allah desires for us to pray. This is irada tashri'iya. This is tashri'i irada. And then you have Allah's desire, Allah's wish for, for example, the plants to undergo photosynthesis. This is irada taqwiniya. This is a taqwini desire. Now when Allah says he desires to punish the munafiqeen through their wealth and through their children, is this irada tashri'i or taqwini? It's taqwini because it's the natural consequence of placing hope in your wealth and in your children and seeing them as being independent of God and as seeing them as belonging to you and not as a trust that is given to Allah. So this irada, when God says he desires, it refers to this existential desire, desiring, this, you know, this taqwini, this, you know, this natural, uh, the, the desire that we see in the natural world and the natural going about. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Uh, uh, Sheikh, uh, please, I would like you to throw a little bit more light on uh, Iradaya Tashriya and Iradaya Taqwiniya, uh, yes. the legislative desire and the generative desire. Please. Yes. Now, as I mentioned, in the Quran, you're going to find this verb used. You know, innama yuridu Allah. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he says, يُرِيدُ بِكُمُ الْيُسْرَ وَلَا يُرِيدُ بِكُمُ الْعُسْرَ Allah desires ease for you. He does not desire difficulty for you. Now, the ayah, the, the ayah that, that I mentioned, that we mentioned today, إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهِ لِيُعَذِّبَهُمْ بِهَا فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا So in the Quran, the verb يُرِيدُ is used in relation to God. God desires, God wishes. And we said that there are two types of irada. There is al irada tashri'iya. Tashri' should be familiar to you. Sharia. Allah desires us to do many things, but He doesn't compel us. Allah desires that you stay away from haram. He desires that you pray five times a day. He desires that you respect your parents, that you look after the poor. He, he wishes for you to do that. But sometimes it may not happen because he has 
he has put it in your hands. He has he has given you free will and he has not coerced you. He's not he has not compelled you. He desires you to do these things. This is al irada tashri'iya, the legislative desiring, the legislative divine will. So God wills that you pray. It may happen and it may not happen. That's that depends on you. It's what he desires because it's for your benefit. This is al irada tashri'iya. But we have another type of irada, and that is al irada taqwiniya. Irada taqwiniya is, you know, what, what Allah says in the Quran: "Inna ma amru idha arada shay'an an yaqul lahu kun fayakun." God desired you to come into existence. This is what irada taqwiniya. It's going to happen. It's like it's a, it's the natural law. It's a, it's the, the general divine will, where it's not a matter of it might happen, it might not happen. It definitely will happen. Now, when Allah speaks in the verse that we mentioned today in ayah number in ayah number uh, fifty six fifty five, when he when Allah says He desires to punish them with it. Meaning he desires to punish the munafiqeen through their wealth and through their children. What type of irada is this? When it says, Innama yuridu Allahu liyu'adhibahum. God desires, he wills, he wishes to punish them through it in this life. This is irada taqwiniya. Meaning this is something that's inevitable. In the same way that plants in, will inevitably undergo photosynthesis when the sun shines this is this is the law of creation the fact that wealth and children will be a source of punishment and misery for the munafiqeen this is this is a divine law this is like this is a sunnah of allah it's a divine policy it's his irada in the same way that he desired you to come into existence and he desired to fashion you in a certain way. It is his decree that this is the natural consequence of placing your hope in things other than him. In feeling that these things belong to you when they don't actually belong to you. So this is an irada taqwiniya. Hopefully that makes it a bit more clear. Very well explained, mashallah.